and welcome to everyone joining us on our Dairy Focus live webinar this evening. We've got some great content for you this evening where we look at dry cow management topics, including selective dry cow therapy, body condition scoring, and setting the herd up for the dry period and, and the next calving season. This is the first of our Dairy Focus live webinars for the autumn season, and I'm sure you'll all be very familiar with the technical updates provided by our Dairy Focus podcast every week. Tonight, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions from our technical team on all things nutrition and animal health. We have a great lineup of speakers for our session this evening with our resident vet, Yara Summers, and nutritionist, Maeve Regan. We'll also hear from one of our dairy farmers in our open source uh, joint future farmers program with Chagask. Jack Kearney is milking 150 cows with his parents in Rathcormick in County Cork. And I know everyone will get a lot of valuable information and practical tips from Jack as to how he's managing his cows and, and that are beginning to be dried off and like you are on your farms at the minute. The format of the webinar this evening is that we'll have two short presentations from Yoris and Maeve with contributions then from Jack as to how he manages his herd in Cork. And then we'll have a question and answer session towards the end of the webinar, uh, 15, 20 minutes at the end. We'd encourage everyone on the call this evening to submit your questions and we'll endeavour to go through as many of those as we can to, uh, during the Q&A session. The webinar this evening will be recorded and will be available afterwards at Glambia Connect and on our YouTube channel. So we'll run our, until around 8.15 this evening uh, with the Q&A session at the end uh, where you can put your questions to our speakers by text message and the number will be up on the screen but it, I'll call it out now, it's 087 one four seven eight one six one and that will be up on the screen as well so later in the webinar me regan will take us through assessing the body condition of the hair to ensure on track and and thinking forward to uh, nutrition management for the winter and and calving in the spring our first topic though is and as you might be aware uh, in 15 months time EU legislation around antibiotic use is going to change. And this will have a significant impact on how we dry off our cows in the lactation. So I'll shortly hand over to Yara Summers, our resident vet, to discuss the management of drying off with a particular focus on selective dry cow therapy, whereby we just use antibiotics on cows that are, are infected and other cows that aren't infected don't need any antibiotic treatment. So just as a reminder to you to become part of the conversation this evening by sending us in your questions to 87 147 So over to you, Joris. Okay. Thanks, Shane. And uh, good evening, everybody. So as Shane pointed out, in about 15 months' time, there is going to be a huge change in the animal health product regulation coming from Europe. And that will be translated into Irish legislation. And a big impact there will be that antibiotics won't be available as a blanket treatment anymore. And how is that going to impact your herd is very much so on the dry cow treatment. So let's go back to the start, I suppose, and say what is selective dry cow therapy, something that I suppose we've been hearing about more and more in the last 18 months, and how does it compare to what's the normal dry cow therapy or Blanket dry cow therapy. So blanket dry cow therapy is where every cow in the herd receives antibiotic tubes at drying off. Selective dry cow therapy is where cows are selected that do not require antibiotics at drying off, and those cows are dried off with a teen sealant only. But why is this change happening? So internationally, there has been more and more reports of antibiotics no longer working against bacterial infections that they were originally designed for. Or in other words, there is antibiotic resistance occurring. Now this is mainly an issue in human medicine where antibiotics are no longer doing the job they used to do, but this is also an issue for animal health. And we are using the same types of antibiotics in animal health as we are in human medicine. And it's that crossover between the veterinary side and, and the human medicine, that is actually why we are now in the situation where the amount of antibiotics that we are using in animals needs to be reduced and the types of antibiotics that we'll be using might be limited. 
So overuse and misuse of antibiotics has really driven this antibiotic resistance, and we have to slow that down. And one of the ways of doing that is by using selective dry gut therapy. So this is coming at us in uh, January 2022. So really, realistically, when you're drying off your animals, it will be, let's say, October, November time, 2022, when this becomes absolute reality for you. But there are a few things that need to be in place before you can successfully use selective dry cow therapy. And some herds have already used selective dry cow therapy in the past, have used it successfully. And we will hear uh, in, in a minute or so from Jack Carney, who has used this in a while, uh, for a while already. But really what this is about is having a structure in place that will allow you to dry off animals without the use of antibiotics, without having high risk of those animals contracting mastitis during the dry period. And this is really looking at the hygiene around drying off, the hygiene in the dry cow housing throughout the dry period, and then also around the calving event. And having these animals reside in an infectious, free or at least low infectious environment, but also not drying off cows that have an infection, but are not being covered by antibiotics. So those are decisions that really need to be made on a herd by herd basis and even on an individual cow basis. And milk recording will be absolutely essential in that. So for those herds who are already using milk recording, you really already have all the information that you need to be trying selective dry cut therapy before it becomes mandatory. But for those herds who are not milk recording yet, now is a good time to actually start planning your milk recording so that by the time it is 2022, you have the information there for you. So I think what we'll do first is we'll go to um, a, a conversation that I had with Jack Carney earlier on how he has used milk recording in the past, good and bad, and how he's looking at the future. Well, we've been using selective dry cow therapy which for four years now, I'd say. And, um, uh, we were flying the first couple of years. We used it as a kind of a cost saving measure. We kind of discussed it between a couple of local farmers here and we decided that it was kind of what is the point in treating cows that didn't need to be treated. So like there's no point in putting in antibiotic and spending money on that when cow doesn't need it. Like so we started off first of all with about ten cows and we gradually worked our way up to about up to near a half of the herd. Uh, in the winter of 2018, heading into spring of 19. And uh, we thought we were well set up. We built a, a new cubicle house and we moved into that winter. And then we, we've calved down and we calved down with serious issues. Um, we had basically a ferocious high cell count. I think the bull tank nearly hit 700,000 there at one stage. So it was, it was a, a, a bad situation to be in now. And we gave a lot of that that um, spring basically treating cows. The big problem we had was the new cubicle in the shed. It was a grand spec cubicle and the cubicle was too big. So the cows were lying too far and they were ducting the cubicles. Now we would have been cleaning cubicles twice a day anyway, but it just, they were getting dirty during the day. So basically the change we made there was we ended up putting in a brisket pipe and we changed the hydrated line and it just allowed basically the cubicle stay drier. When we built the new shed, we were kind of tight in cabin space. So we blew out a blast the cubicles and we ended up making a group cabin pin. So, which was turned out to be a super job. It was a great job for letting cows calve and all that. And, but the issue we had was we were bedding it up very, very heavy with, with straw and then letting it go for two or three days. Cause you'd be busy in the spring, like, so it was right, we'll bed this up now and to be perfect. So we ended up, doing that and the bed would be slightly dirtied in by the time you get back to actually bedding it again. It would never be dungy or anything like that, it would just slightly dirty. So anyway, that we discovered then that was a, a problem we were having as well, that we were bedding it perfectly, but we were just weren't doing it the right way. So anyway, that was another problem we discovered then with heifers picking up mastitis as well. What we done last year then was using the same amount of straw, only we put in a bale a day as well as three bales every three days and it just solved the problem. So like last year now we would have only done maybe 5% of the herd just to basically we were kind of, we'd said we won't give this up because we're going to have to do it anyway. So we got good results from that. So we're going to go back now to what we are. We think we have our problem solved and we're going to go with about a third of the herd.
this year. And we just think that we're going to use uh, certain criteria to determine what codes we're going to do. So we're going to use say, a cell, average cell count of 80 um, for the last two weeks lactations and never over 100 at any point in the year. And we just think that we think that's a, any, any cow at that doesn't have a problem. Well, how is that going to go for the, the, the cows getting selective dry cow therapy? What, what goes into that for you? What's a typical morning uh, of, of selective dry cow therapy? We don't tend to do too many at a time. Um, just for the amount of time it takes to do it, to, to do it right, it takes time, I suppose, you know. So generally we'd have two in the pit and at most we'd ever do is maybe 30, maybe two rows, 32. Um, so you'd have 15, 16 each, like, you know. And um, myself and the father would be doing it. Yep. We'd generally make the cows and then tackle into them after maybe a cup of tea or something like that and just take our time to it and my mother then would be say myself and the father we'd have the torches on and we'd have the clean gloves and all that and we'd we'd uh, have our routine we'd both have our own routines and stuff that we just tip away at it and then the mother would be handling us stuff then so there'd be three of us in the pit that morning when we would be joining them off and we generally leave them standing for an hour or two afterwards because we we, we would have a wettish farm here so we don't generally let them out after they're dried, we generally just dry them inside in the shed um, and we just leave them stand for an hour or two before we do leave them into the cubicles, make sure the cubicles are well limed for a couple of days afterwards and that's kind of the, the routine we have. So Yaris, really good insights there from Jack Carney in Cork and great to hear his open and honest experience of, of using selective dry cow therapy. I'd say Yaris, his experience is not uncommon regarding the housing issues that he had causing mastitis in the, in the spring? No, absolutely. It's, it's one of those areas that is easily overlooked and given the huge expansion we've seen in many herds across the country in cow numbers, but not necessarily in the housing uh, facilities for those extra numbers. I think it's, it's one of the bigger issues that we will have to cope with um, in, in this whole selective dry cow therapy. Uh, story yes absolutely no and, and that just getting every bit of it right i mean you can do a really good job in drying off hygiene to the last and then you know if the housing's not right at, at calving time or through the dry period you can it, as 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 jack had found it can, can go wrong and cause significant mm -hmm. problems just yours for the farmers at home how how would we go about choosing the the most suitable cows in the herd for not getting the antibiotic tubes and uh, what what reports or results would uh, would help uh, farmers mm -hmm. choose those. Yeah, so as, as, as you could hear from, from Jack's experience and, and how he selects the cows, it's very much based on the individual cows cell count records from the milk recording. Um, and he also uses the average cell count records for the current lactation and the, the previous lactation. So what Jack has done is really use his monthly milk recordings uh, to see whether or not the herd as a whole is still eligible for selective dry cut therapy. And then when it comes to the end of lactation, you will actually go into ICBF, uh, into the profiles tab, you'll have your milk profiles for SEC. And that will give you a full overview of the entire herd and every milk recording, or at least the last six milk recordings. And there you can put in really any sort of number that suits you and suits your herd as a cutoff for the limit you want to put on. So. What Jack has chosen there is 80,000 as an average cell count for his previous lactation and the current lactation, and then 100,000 uh, as an SEC level for each individual milk recording for every cow since she calved down this year. If you feel that that's not the right numbers for you, you can change those numbers. And I know more Park, for example, Chagas, they use, I think, 50,000 as the average for previous lactation and current lactation and then 100,000 for the individual milk recordings. So you certainly have a, have a freedom to put in the number that you feel comfortable with. It's, it's great, Darius, that farmers will have that flexibility to, to choose. And, and of course, once you're actually not given antibiotic to any cow in the herd, you're engaging in selective dry cow therapy. It doesn't have to be half the herd. It doesn't have to be three quarters of the herd. It, it's, it's any uh -huh. number. Absolutely, and, and, and going back to Jack, he, in 2018, they had done 50% of the herd. Obviously, as he explained to us, it went wrong. They still went and did 5% of the herd. 
So in, even in a year where things weren't great, they still managed to do a selective drug therapy program because they didn't want to give up on it. And mm. so this year now in 2020, they're going back to 30% of the herd. But yeah, absolutely. If you are only starting with selective drug therapy, I would actually suggest don't attempt to try this on 30% of the herd, but keep the numbers small mm. with your lowest cell count animals and go for maybe five or 10% of the herd and that's it. So if we go for five or 10% of the herd this year, we have a, another chance at it next year. And then this legislation will be in the following year and people will be comfortable with doing it at that point. And of course, people will still be able to get antibiotic tubes for the cows that need it, ideally as few as possible because we don't want cows with high cell count, uh, but that will still be available. Just Yaris, take us through, I mean, obviously when you're not putting in an antibiotic tube, it's drying off, take us through the, the additional hygiene uh, requirements at that time. Yeah, so if, if we're leaving out the antibiotic tube, we have to be absolutely squeaky clean. And as, as it, it is often referred to as near surgical cleanliness, so nearly sterile conditions around the cow, because you, the last thing you want to be doing is introducing an infection at the time of drying off, where you're sealing the infection in the quarter without any antibiotic inside that quarter to actually tackle that infection. So it's really about having the extra person there that can hand you the tools and the tubes and everything that you need in the right order so that the person who's actually touching the, the teeth, seal and tube and the cow's teeth doesn't touch anything else around the cow, the parlor, any other equipment, a bucket, doesn't matter, that they don't touch anything and that they keep their gloves absolutely squeaky clean. Even what you could try is wear two pairs of gloves, so one inside the other, so that your first pair, that might get dirty and contaminated, you take those off, and when you actually are at the point of introducing the teeth sealant, you have the cleanest set of gloves right there and then to, to carry that out. Very good, Joris, yeah, very important indeed. Just Joris and conscious of time, but uh, are there other sources of, of information on this topic that, that our farmers at home can, can resource to? Certainly, I mean, there's always Glambia Connect that has a lot of information in it, but there is also uh, Animal Health Ireland with its cell check program, which is a very good program that will actually guide you through selective dry cow therapy step by step. And they have some really helpful uh, uh, video, different steps that go into a, a successful drying off protocol uh, for, for those herds going down the selective dry cow route. Yaris, thanks very much for your info there and to Jack Kearney for that video. We'll have Jack on again in a few minutes with, with Maeve, but just as a reminder, and there's some questions coming in there already uh, for you later on, Yaris, uh, in the Q&A session. Um, so just to remind everyone to send in your questions uh, as we go, uh, as I say, some really good questions coming in, and we'll go through those in about 10 or 12 minutes. So Maeve, over to yourself just to take us through uh, with, with Jack, a uh, piece on the body condition scoring of the herd and uh, nutritional planning for the for the winter ahead. Yeah, thanks Shane. And look, we'll keep this really practical. And basically over the last couple of weeks on the podcast, you'll have all seen that we've been talking about setting up our milking platform for next spring. And what we have to do in order to have sufficient grass next spring to achieve an early turnout. But similarly to this, we also need to set up our cow to have a successful spring. It's a busy and stressful time period on farm and we want to avoid any issues or risks um, such as metabolic diseases happening on that farm. And when we talk about setting our cow up for next spring, ultimately we're gonna be talking about body condition score and having our cow in the right condition to have a maximum, a meter maximum potential next spring. When we talk about best practice with body condition score, ideally we would have our cows in the target body condition score at the point of dry off and just maintain this condition over the dry period to calf her down in the same condition. And that target being that body condition score three to 3.2. But when we talk about those target cows, we are getting closer to drying off. So sometimes we talk about building body condition score and the most cost effective way to do it is while she's in milk as opposed to when she's already dry. But we're getting close to that drying off period now as well. So we need to react quickly and make informed decisions on farm to set ourselves up properly. With target cows, the target obviously is to have a 60 day dry period and every additional day up to that 60 day point that we see cows are dry, 
we get a positive effect in regards to output and performance in subsequent lactation. And then likewise, when we go every additional day, we go over that 60 days with those target cohort cows, we actually see a negative effect on the next lactation. Why? Because they've become over conditioned, they're now fat cows. So we want to target that with our target cows, but then we also might have thin cows in the herd and fat cows in the herd at the moment. And what do we do with them? With thin cows, we want to ideally build up body reserves, drying her off early, letting her get a head start to build back up that condition so she sets herself up for the next period. And I'm stealing Jack Carney's thunder here, but he talks about short-term loss for long-term gain. And it is all about setting us up now at this time of the year for next year. In regards to fat cows, it might be thinking about diluting down the silage quality that's in front of them or restricting intake. But it's important when we talk about any sort of restrictions that headspace is um, on farm is sufficient. That's a limiting factor in a lot of yards. But if we just talk about the two different types of cows, so a cow that'll calf down the body condition score of three compared to a cow that'll calf down the body condition score of less than 2.75, so a slightly thinner cow, but not an awful difference. We're talking about not only having a knock-on effect on the risks at spring when she loses more body condition score, but also that they'll have an effect on the subsequent breeding season. And we see conception rates with those two types of cows falling from 72% to 57%. So long-term effects from what we're doing now and the decisions that will be made in the next couple of weeks. So not only will body condition score be a consideration what we do with feed plan, but so will silage quality and forage quality. When we talk about measuring grass during the year, we're talking about farming blind where you're not measuring grass regularly. It's the exact same when we're feeding cow silage that we don't know what quality is in the pit. So get your silage quality and then we'll make a feed plan accordingly. But for now, we will look at what Jack Kearney is doing in Rathcormac in regards to setting his cows up for the oncoming dry period. Oh, well, we're at 13.9 litres, uh, five one foot. 5.11 fat and 4.13 protein, so it brings us to about 1.33 kgs of milk solids. Okay. So it's it's ranging from full days to kind of three hour stints, um, depending on day. And if it's just too, if weather doesn't allow, we just don't go out. And it's all on ground conditions. We we walk it every morning just to see what way the ground is. And if it's not good enough, we're not going to go damaging paddocks. There's no point. But every every day we get from now on at grass is a bonus. So. Um, and a, a key KPI for that period will be body condition score. So we might just have a chat about body condition score. It's something you use on farm as a, a nutrition factor or you take it into account on farm. Yeah, so um, we body condition scored the cows back in July here through the Green Breed Programme and uh, they were kind of ranging between 2.75 and 3.25. Now generally, when I'm looking at a cow, I don't generally use the body condition scores. I just kind of go a thin cow, fat cow, what, could, what you want in a cold in nice condition and it's simpler and it just it takes the variability out of it because everyone knows what a fat cow is and everyone knows what a thin cow is so that's what we'll do now going into the autumn we'll pick out our thin cows and we'll give them give them a longer dry period so that it, it kind of gives them a chance to recuperate and we'll give them uh just a longer dry cow period with good quality silage so they won't need meal but they'll have a chance to recover and they'll be good to go for next lactation in the spring so that's the plan with yeah. them. Fat cows then will will probably they'll get a when they are dry they'll get a, an average quality size. They might even get restricted in size a small bit, um, but nothing major, you know. But we don't generally have a problem. Generally, cow cow, cow condition is quite good here. Um, we don't generally have very fat cows or the other way, you know. So it's only going to be a handful of cows either way. So we're happy enough really where we are you know, that way. But thin cows will get looked after all right, to be fair. Um, just basically, dry cows will get eight weeks then and they won't get fat on because the soil won't be too good for them. They'll just maintain body condition and it's basically, they, they should be they should be in good enough order to calve down for the next spring, but also give them, give them time to, for the others and cell count issues and stuff like that to recover as well over the long dry period. So it's kind of, we were a great believer in a, a good good dry period for cows here and yeah. Have you a plan for replacements over the winter? Of what is you know we want to make sure that we're hitting targets obviously next spring. So what's the plan with them? Yeah, so plan for replacements actually is we have plenty of grass and they're actually grazing silage blocks at the moment on out farms. So they they have plenty of grass, so they're going to be out on 
till mid December anyway, at, at least for now anyway. Um, that's all weather dependent again. But when they do come in, they will get that good first cut silage along with two kgs meal, and that should be that should help them grow along. And then the plan would be to get them out early again next year. Um, especially if there is any lagging behind, they will go out um, and they, they will get grass early in, in the spring. So again, we have great insights from uh, Jack there in terms of uh, managing nutrition on his farm and, and, and drying off and body condition score. And, and Jack, uh, you know, body condition scored back in July. Uh, he, he takes a very simple approach to it, uh, fit, fat and, and thin. Is that as much as farmers need to do? Yeah, and look, it's all about simplicity. And Jack is a big believer in keeping things simple um, and the plan simple over the winter period. So. It is, it don't, if you are thinking about body condition score in cows and, you know, your body condition score, and yet maybe you haven't done it so far this year, keep it simple. Don't get bogged down between 0.25s of a body condition score. It is as simple really as fat, fit and thin. Um, and really and truly, it's just keeping it really simple and making good informed decisions. And it's also worth at times getting someone from outside to throw a second eye on these cows, because sometimes we are biased towards our own cows. We're looking at them every single day of the week. And that's one thing we hear back from our own business managers, Maeve, that are out on farms and maybe not as much this year, but, you know, they're going from one farm to another and they can keep a track on what they're seeing on, on, on different herds that arguably should have, because the person who's looking at the cows every day sometimes doesn't see it. Yeah. And also we have a vast array of cows um, in this country. So, uh, you know, very different cow types out there, very different systems that are out there as well. So worth getting a second eye on these cows, getting a second opinion, but definitely keeping it simple. Don't get caught up in figures. Maybe the weather has gone pretty hard there in the last couple of weeks and uh, a, lot of, a lot of cows housed, nearly all cows housed in the past week. And we've probably reached the end of the grazing season. What advice would you have for farmers? The whole milk yeah. output for the for the last few weeks of the lactation yeah and again without sounding like a broken record it is going to all revolve around silage quality but also farm setup facilities that are available to you feedstuffs that are available to you on farm but again know what's in the pit know what quality you have and then supplement accordingly so obviously the poor quality forage that we have more supplementation may be required but again, it's just matching cow output to cow input to the inputs that we put into that cow and making sure that our energy requirements are met because there is a, a chunk left in the lactation. We want to make the most of it and maximize the cow's potential. Yeah, there's there's some milk solids to be got yet out of those cows in the next in the next few weeks, absolutely. I mean, milk lactose is a talking point at the moment, dropping back. Uh, you might give us a quick insight into that. Yeah, uh, milk lactose is often talked about in regards to processing milk and the processability of milk. But from a nutritionist's point of view, milk lactose can also tell us some issues that might be going on on farm. So at this time of year, when we move into late lactation, well-fed cows would hope to have a whole milk lactose above 4.5. In late lactation, we often see that start to decline below that, but we want to keep it at all times above 4.35 in order for processing. But again, what will cause fallen milk lactose is you're talking about poor quality feed available to, in front of the cows stressful events, low output cows, um, uh, dra grazing in tough or wet conditions. Uh, these kind of things, stressful events will have a knock-on effect on your bulk tank milk lactose analysis. But it's just, I would say, you know, pick out your low performing cows, your thin cows, dry them off early because um, they'll be having a negative effect on your overall bulk tank um, milk lactose level. Great stuff, Maeve. And we've got some questions coming in there on, on, on nutrition topics, uh, but maybe we'll move on to the, the Q&A session now. And Joris, you might, uh, you might come in and join the conversation there as well. Um, so we've actually a good few questions come in there, Joris, on your, your topic uh, on the selective dry cow therapy. First one is from Shane in Cork. Um, is there any specific bacteria that could cause problems with selective dry cow therapy if present in the herd? Um, I think what's, what's, yes, there actually is, uh, is the short answer. So there is a, a very specific bacteria called Strap agalactiae, and it's quite contagious. Um, and it's one of those bacteria that it, it's treated quite easily, but even if your herd qualifies for all the criteria based on cell count and, and 
the number of cases of mastitis and so on during a lactation to do selective dry cow therapy, there is absolutely uh, some, some evidence, some scientific evidence that if that is the bacteria that is in your herd, you would be best not to use selective dry cow therapy because that one specific bacteria could actually cause issues. So if that is the bacteria in your herd, which you would have to have identified through some sort of bacteriology, so milk culturing and sensitivity, for example, and you find that bacteria, then you could, there is an argument there absolutely to say all the cows will need antibiotic for their dry period. Yeah, and yours, just another question in, it's from Kieran in County Cavan. Um, is there any issue with not treating a cow with a very low cell count, say below 30,000, so below 30? And with not treating, I'm assuming it's antibiotic? Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. I don't think there is an issue with not treating that cow. Now, cows with very, very low cell count, they, this is, no, there's a few caveats here, but it could be an indication that those cows actually have a stressed immune system and therefore are not producing enough of an immune response and therefore their cell count is very, very low. Uh, so they actually wouldn't be able to react to an infection on their own. Uh, but in general, a low cell count, those cows absolutely can just do with a teeth seed. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. And um, just one more, Yaris, for yourself while we're on it. It was about, um, just let me find it again. Uh, yeah, what's the view on, and I don't know where this has come in from, if, if people want to add in their name and their county, uh, I don't have this number on the phone, but uh, what's the view to removing other hair to improve cleanliness around the teeth area? Yeah, absolutely. Um, removing the other hair, clipping the cow's tail, uh, all of that will help tremendously in improving the hygiene uh, of the teeth. So when, when it comes to drying off and, and during the dry period, not having the hair on the tail or the other there is, 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 is a very good uh, step in, in keeping the hygiene levels up, absolutely, yeah. Maeve, over to yourself. We have a couple of questions in about replacement heifers. So one farmer, uh, he doesn't say where, but has his replacement heifers a bit behind target for their age. What's he going to do with those this winter? How's he going to catch up? Yeah, and look, replacement heifers can sometimes be kind of a forgotten about group of animals on farm. But they are so important to the overall system and it's important that we have them on target. So ideally, we'd like to weigh heifers before they're housed and then keep them growing over the winter period. And that will depend on silage quality on how much concentrates we're feeding. But then also that we hit the ground early um, next spring, we get early turnout with those heifers, especially heifers that are below target weights. Um, because the ultimate aim really is to be 60% of the, the herd's mature body weight at the point of breeding. So we won't feel that coming around. So it's about having those heifers on target and getting that early turnout and then feeding over the winter period, obviously, according to what silage quality you have in front of them. But definitely, uh, if you have heifers that are behind target, they need focus in order to have, you know, get a good result at, during the breeding season because we do not want to see poor results with replacement heifers next spring when it comes to breeding. And the second question is also on heifers. This is in calf heifers, uh, well grown in good condition. Should they get a meal with 70 plus DMD silage? And if they're getting meal, how much would they get? Well yeah, and again, yeah, again, look, if they're well grown in good condition, we're talking about, I, I would prefer to say what percentage of their mature weight they are. So if you get your average herd mature weight, and some herd, like there'll be a huge difference between herds in regards to what their mature weight is. We want to calf her down at 90% of that weight. Um, is she on target to hit that would be the first question you'd ask. But yeah, if they're in good condition and they're on target and you have high quality 75 DMD silage in front of them, that'll be adequate to maintain them. If not, if its silage quality isn't good, obviously then we'd have to put in a supplement, but really important also to get a dry cow or a pre calf and mineral into those in calf heifers to ensure that we have clean or smooth sailing come next spring when they start to calf. Another question just relating to the body condition, may the farmer here who has fat cows, a number of fat cows in the herd, can he restrict their intakes? How easy is that to do? <laughs> Yeah, restricted intakes um, will all be very dependent on headspace availability on farm. And headspace in a lot of yards is the limiting factor here. So you can't do it unless you have a, 
proper headspace for every cow, as you know, the, cow, the front cows that will always bully their way to the front and then you'll have other cows that won't get in. Another option where headspace isn't, uh, isn't sufficient is you dilute down the energy that's in the diet and that's good silage with something like straw. So we dilute down the forage that's available or the energy in that forage av available instead of actually restricting it. So dependent on farm facilities, but yeah, headspace will be number one there. Yeah, and just while we're on it, maybe a question from Jack in Wicklow regarding his weanland heifers, slightly aligned to what you've covered already, but a question for yourself on replacement heifers, uh, slightly ahead of target, 250 plus kilos in weight, roughly what silage quality and if any meal required? Yeah, and it'll depend on what silage quality is there. I would say your best quality silage should go to your replacement heifers. You know, if it's if it's there, we want to give them good quality silage. Um, we don't want to be given poor quality silage. And in regards to supplementation, even on 75 DMD silage or plus, we want to get in about half a kilo of concentrates to a kilo of concentrates there, just to make sure our mineral requirement is met and to keep those heifers ticking along and maintaining themselves. But then we want to ex we don't want to go too heavy at feeding because we want to exploit cheap um, compensatory growth and hit grass early next spring and get that spurt of growth. So it's a it's a fine line, but definitely high quality silage in front of them. Um, keep your feed costs down, put a small bit of supplementation and then hit grass as soon as you can next spring. Good stuff. Grass is key, isn't it? Grass is key. Yeah. Um, Yaris, back to yourself. Um, question from John, doesn't say where, but can you use hydrated lime on its own to bed cubicles or will it burn teats? And I know there's some concern there with certain types of lime and some are okay if you've got other sawdust or straw on top, but take us through the, the, the use of uh, disinfectant lime on, on cubicles. Yeah, there certainly is a risk. Uh, lime is caustic. Um, so, and and I think Jack Carney said it very well that you know the, the 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 lime is can absolutely you know you need to be yourself be sure you're wearing a, a mask and, and and goggles and so on protect yourselves. Uh, there is a risk, absolutely. Um, but in my experience, if the cubicles are kept dry enough, that risk is is limited. Uh, is 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 my experience. So um, it, it 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 there is a risk, but it's it's limited if the cubicles are kept in in good shape. Yeah. yeah. No. Very good. We've a uh, question in from Shane Fitzgerald, another of our open source feature farmers in in Waterford. Uh, thanks for the feedback, Shane, on on the podcast so far, on the video webinar so far. Um, question for you, Yaris, in in selective dry cow therapy. What's your recommendation in relation to teat sealed? only cows that continue to leak milk more than a week post drying. Challenging to cut the volumes of milk it can be with some cows, isn't it? It can be very challenging. And if you're if you're having to dry off a cow because of her calving date approaching, so to speak, and you want to give her those two months dry period, it can be really challenging to dry off a cow that is still milking quite strongly. Um, and cows leaking milk after they've been dried off is always a bit of a worry. It's not unusual for a sealant to be in place successfully and milk still to be seeping past it. Um, teat sealant is like putty and it just needs time to set. So it, it's not uncommon. And in, in my experience and from what I've been told from, from the producers of the teat sealants, that is, that is normal. The teat sealant is in place and it will do its job. Um, so that's, as much as I can tell you, really. Yeah. yeah, it just takes that bit of time for the teeth to close in properly. Form it, it does, it does, yeah. To form that seal around the, the teeth sealer in time. Uh, just coming in there, a question on uh, on the chat in on YouTube live, which you can, if you're registered on YouTube, you can message a question in live. So from Kevin, what type, what kind of minerals and uh, MAVE should weanling heifers get through the winter? Um, yeah, and ideally, look, if you're going to be feeding a concentrate supplementation, get a high quality, protected, good quality mineral going in through that concentrate supplementation, just to keep everything very easy and simple over that winter period. And again, we'll actually, in our next Dairy Live, um, our Dairy Focus Live, we'll be talking specifically on minerals, uh, supplementation and dry cow minerals over the winter period, um, which is in two weeks time. But yeah, high quality mineral, get it included in the concentrate supplementation. And obviously just keep things very simple then, feed accordingly to what quality silage you have in front of them. Great stuff, me. 
Maeve, and just I know we'll cover it next next time in two weeks' time on the dry cow minerals. But when should people be thinking about starting to feed dry cow minerals? As soon as possible um, is is the the real answer there. Um, as soon as we have cows dry, we want to get high quality mineral into them ASAP, uh, so that we have a sufficient build up time period then, so that things are we we avoid any risk of anything happening at the point of calving. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Yara's a question for you on milk recording. Uh, it's coming. Uh, there's no name on it, but. Uh, with only around 25 to 30 percent of farmers milk recording which it's higher than that as we know uh, who's going to do all the work and the second part of the question i, I might take after uh, are glambia going to help incentivize farmers to milk record I'm, I'm glad you'd take the second part chain um as you said the the, the level of milk recording is higher than the 30 percent so we're well above 40 percent and, and closer to 50 percent i think at this stage um, but absolutely it is a huge challenge uh, for the milk recording companies to accommodate all the farmers that still want to get involved in milk recording. And they have told us that they are working on it. They are uh, getting the technology in place to be able to do milk recording for more herds, but they have already indicated that they won't be able to do 100% of the herds by January, 2022. Uh, and that's the reality that we're, that we're in. But a figure of 75% has been mentioned. And if you look at the eligible herds for selective dry cow therapy based on both tank records, that would actually include all the herds eligible for selective dry cow therapy. So I think there is actually, there will be enough capacity to do milk recording for those herds who are currently in a situation that they could do selective dry cow therapy. Thanks, Joris. And, and just to take the, the question in terms of incentivization from Glambia on, on milk recording, absolutely. We recognize fully the value of milk recording. And if you take, forgetting even about milk quality, but just in terms of the efficiency of cows, we know that there's a significant proportion of cows in pretty much all herds that are not paying their way. And the best way to identify those cows from a milk solids production point of view is to milk record and, and, and benchmark. And there's 15% of herds typically in most herds, 15% of animals in most herds that are actually costing money to have in the herd. Best thing to do is to get rid of those animals. So obviously big, big value in that. Uh, plenty of reasons why farmers would engage in it. Just like you mentioned, Yaris, that the milk recording companies are working on it. We're working on it in the background. Indeed, we had a call this afternoon uh, going through a number of uh, initiatives that we're looking at for next year. Obviously, lots of work to be done in the background yet, but uh, very, very positive. So uh, watch this space. Um, Yaris, a question on, on culture and sensitivity. So the bacteriology testing and then using, um, uh, so someone has asked about culture and sensitivity, just to explain it, it's running the bacteriology tests to identify what the bacteria are that's causing the mastitis or the high cell count, and then the sensitivity tests on those to identify the tubes. Will the legislation, the question is, will the legislation require that? So as it currently stands, the legislation that is going to come into place does not require a culture and sensitivity testing to be carried out for cows to receive a prescription for the antibiotics if they need the antibiotics. There may be a requirement for specific types of antibiotics. Um, and those are identified as the antibiotics that are seen as highly important or critically important antibiotics because they have very specific uses in human medicine and therefore should only be used as a last resort in dry cow treatments or you know mastitis treatments especially if there are other antibiotics that will do the same job for the cow but wouldn't do the same job for the person that needs the treatment so that is something that could come in but for in general, there will there is not currently in the legislation a requirement to carry out culture and sensitivity testing. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks very much, Charles. Just may have a question that has come in there. Uh, someone on milk lactose. They're saying their lactose level has dropped significantly in the last few days. What's the problem, and how do they fix it? Yeah, and it could be multiple issues. And um, to be honest with you, it could be a stressful event in the herd. It could be the tough grazing conditions that have been playing out the last couple of days. Um, and it can also be some low production cows 
or poor quality forage in front of the in front of the cows. So again, see what forage of it, um, quality you have available to you. But look at those low producing cows, th those thin cows that were want to dry off to build up body condition. But those cows that are given between you know less than ten to twelve liters. Think about drying those cows off because they'll have a, a negative effect on your overall tank analysis for milk lactose. So that that's how we try and counteract it. Um, and again, try keep it above the, the level required for processing. Yeah. A uh, question from Wexford is short and sweet, but they've obviously got some straw down there. Should I use straw in the dry cow diet? Yeah. And if silage quality allows to, and you want to dilute silage quality down, of course, we could put in silage or we could put in straw into that diet. Um, and straw, especially in some cases where you might have a, a bigger intake cow, straw is actually a nice bulky fibrous feed to include in the diet because it keeps her rumen and her stomach quite stretched over that dry period. So it allows her to have that high intake capacity after calfing. Um, again, some people do that with bulky fibrous grass silage that's poor quality, you need to go ad libitum with it. But yeah, straw, an option there where silage quality is higher and we can dilute it down with straw and keep that rumen quite full and bulky and fibrous and set her up properly for good intakes next spring. And may have a question uh, from Leash, from Pat in Leash. He's got some thin cows. Will he go once a day? Will he feed them more or will he just dry them off? Yeah, and you'll hear a lot of talk about this. Um, and you really and truly to build body condition, you want to put in more than you're taking out. But when it comes to somatic cell count issues and that and going once a day could have a detrimental effect on those kind of things. Ideally, we want to just dry those cows off early and let them build body condition score, give them the head start they need on the rest of the herd. Sometimes it will depend on facilities. You might be able to put groups of cows and have thin cows grouped with and target cows grouped and fat cows grouped. But Often they're just a handful of cows um, in the herd, so it mightn't be practical to do that. So give them the head start, dry them off early and let them build body condition on good quality silage before we start drying off the main cohort of the herd. Mm -hmm. um, another Pat in County Louth, Joris, um, wants to dry off. He's got uh, liquid milk herd, but he's got his autumn cows, spring calving cows to be dried off. He wants to dry off in the next couple of weeks. Um, should he do another milk recording soon? His last one was in August. Uh, can he work from the August um, milk recording, I suppose, is the question. Yeah, that, that's a good question, actually, because the timing of the milk recordings is important. And if you're drying off your cows and, and really whether or not you're doing selected dry cow therapy, you, you want to be having a, a, a milk recording closer to drying off than back in August. Uh, but for specifically for selected dry cow therapy, you really want to be having a milk recording done no more than 30 days prior to drying off. So Pat is looking at drying off his cows over in two, three weeks. I actually say, would say try and do another milk recording now because that will give you the more accurate data on your individual cows. And the benefit of doing that milk recording now still is that you will get a very good result then on how your dry cow management has gone if you also do a milk recording quite early after calving. Now, being a, um, a split calving herd with an autumn herd, there certainly is, is, is huge benefit in Pat doing milk recording now, because you will also get readings for his autumn calving cows if they've, if they've started calving already or, uh, and, and are on their way. So he'll actually get, he'll catch the two in, in one go. He'll, he'll get the late milk, uh, lactation milk recording for the spring calving herd, and he might get a very early lactation milk recording for the autumn calving herd. So I would say, Pat, work away and get your milk recording done. Yeah. Guys, the questions keep coming in, so we're just going to run over for a few minutes, if that's all right. Uh, hopefully everyone will stick with us. Uh, three questions for yourself, Yaris, and one for Maeve at the minute, and, and that uh, that's what we have in. So um, question. Well, I, I'll actually add this uh, second part to this question, but uh, this is from Michael in Tipperary. And should he use teeth sealer and his in-calf heifers as they go in for winter? Um, so the question is, you know, maiden heifers in calf going into the house, should he use teat sealer? And then I'll add that, I'll add to that because we have overheard that some people might be doing it, uh, using dry cow tubes in maiden heifers as well, going into the shed. What's your thoughts, Charles? So in some herds, um, there, there will be a benefit to the teat sealant. 
in, in the maiden heifers, uh, especially in those herds where the housing isn't hygienic, where the animals might be under pressure, um, maybe where nutrition is lacking a little bit, so the animals mightn't have grown enough or, or mightn't have an immune system that is fully competent in, in fighting off infection. And in herds, especially where the dry cow or the, the calving cow area is going to be overstocked. So those are all underlying issues that probably should be looked at and resolved if possible. But if that's not possible, then a tea sealant in your maiden heifers might be a temporary solution uh, for, for, for getting over that risky period. On the antibiotics, I'd be very, very cautious with using antibiotics in, in uh, maiden heifers. Um, there can be huge residue issues um, because the maiden heifers, their mammary glands are not fully developed. So it's, it's really unknown where that antibiotic goes and how long it sticks around after calving. So I, I would be very reluctant to, to, to go ahead with antibiotics in, in maiden heifers. Absolutely, yours. And look, food safety is what we're about. And antibiotic residues in milk, no one wants it. Certainly, it's, it's, it's not a runner in food. Uh, question on, on teat sealers from Ollie in Kilkenny. How many milkings does it take for the teat sealer to clear from the teat? That's a, a, a good question. Again, a lot, a lot of it comes down, Ollie, to how the teat sealant was introduced in the first place. So the, the injecting the teat sealant or infusing the teat sealant into the teat, you have to do the exact opposite of when you infuse an antibiotic tube. So where with an antibiotic tube, you massage the product up in through the teat into the quarter with a teat sealant, you actually want to pinch off the teat at the base where it meets the quarter and let the teat sealant fill up the teat, but not get into the quarter. Because if it gets into the quarter, then God knows how long it takes before the, the, the TC actually is completely removed from, from the quarter. Um, but from, from if, if, if it's just in the teeth, it should actually be removed quite quickly over the first two milkings, it should be gone. Perfect. So it's really about leaving it in the teeth canal Absolutely. rather than putting it up too far. And, and Maeve, a couple of questions have come in again, Yaris, for yourself, but Maeve, one last question for you at this stage anyway. Um, is arable silage good enough for in-calf heifers if it's good quality? Um, yeah, and arable silage, look, it'll depend on what type, obviously, that's, that's available and what the quality is. But realistically, we don't like to see anything too high in energy going into in-calf heifers. We don't want to over-condition heifers. We don't want to put... Uh, condition on heifers and have fat heifers calving down into the herd because as we know those fat heifers and fat cows are four to nine times more likely to have an issue around calf in regards to metabolic diseases so be very very careful and um, get a balanced diet in front of those heifers we don't want too much energy or too much of anything going into in calf heifers or likewise dry cows Great, Maeve. That's, that's great info. Um, yours, the last two questions are related and they're actually on a topic that we're going to cover in our next uh, webinar in, in in Dairy Focus Live in two weeks' time uh, about parasite control. So um, just we have an anonymous question here. Can I treat the cows for worms on the same day as drying off or do I need to wait till after? And the second question is from PJ in Mullingar. Um, should I dose the cows for fluke at drying off time, for worms and fluke at drying off time, or will I wait to the next round of bulk milk screening results is in to see what the parasite levels are? Okay, so people jumping the gun uh, to, for next week or, or in two weeks' time, but uh, if you're, let's, let's do the first one, the anonymous one first. Um, so dosing for worms, if that's the only concern, um, it, it sort of depends on the product you're hoping to use because as, as I hope everyone is very well aware, a few of the clear warmers, so your ivermectins, they require 60-day milk withdrawal. So for a lot of cows, that will actually mean that they have to be done at the moment of drying off. Otherwise, they run into residue issues after calving. Obviously, if you're using products that are a shorter milk withdrawal, then you can wait and you don't do them. Um, on the flukes, there's some, some subtleties there depending on which product you're using to do fluke. Um, if the cows have only just come in from grazing, 
there is some benefit in, in potentially waiting a little bit longer. So waiting another week or two. And actually, as we're in the second week of November now, there is a round of bulk tank testing happening specifically for fluke um, at the moment for those herds that are spring calving. So if you wait even a few days, you will actually have a result uh, that will tell you whether or not you need to dose for fluke uh, in the first place. And then if you do, you have a bit of time uh, to get the right product uh, for your fluke dosing if, if, that, if that needs to happen. Or you, based on the, on, the, on the bulk tank screening, decide to only go in with the dose for, for stomach worms. And so of course, lots works there. Yeah, lots and lots of farms less so needing to use fluke dosing now, and that's been shown by a herd disease screening service. And it's credit to people who got fluke in control on their farms uh, with with judicious dosing over the years. But where they don't have it now, they don't need to, and that's that's great, Joris. Uh, Joris and Maeve, that's the end of the questions um, at the minute. So um, we'll probably, I'm sure, have. Uh, We'll probably I'm sure have lots more questions um, at the next session uh, in two weeks time um, just I'd like to thank everyone for joining the webinar this evening and for your participation um, and, and, and your questions as well um, there's a couple of questions just coming in but just given the time we'll, we'll cover those off with individual people uh, afterwards um, every farm is different uh, out there so look there's plenty of bespoke solutions uh, for your own farm situation available through Yaris and, and Maeve, through business managers, through milk quality managers, uh, farm development managers locally. Um, don't be afraid to get in touch with your local Glambia representative. There's also loads of great technical information available on the Glambia Connect website and on our weekly e-zine and on our Dairy Focus podcast. And when you're on the YouTube channel this evening, if you subscribe to that channel, you'll get your Dairy Focus podcast updates on, on a weekly basis. So hope everyone has got some really good information from the webinar this evening and some really practical tips from our speakers and from, from Jack Kearney as well. Uh, we'll have the second Dairy Focus live in two weeks and Yaris will cover off herd disease management, parasite control, vaccinations and so on. And Maeve will cover dry cow minerals and we'll have contributions then from our open source feature farmer, Shay Ryan from County Wexford. And we hope we'll, you'll be able to join us and the 25th of November at the same time, 7.30. So to finish up this evening, thanks to everyone for joining and participating to our speakers, to Jack Kearney. Stay safe on farm. Uh, have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>